time for some off-season maintenance for the RX-8. Maintenance complete. What is up, Rad Potential YouTube? Welcome to today's video where we're talking about maintaining your Mazda RX-8. And no, this is not going to be the hardest thing that you ever have to do. It's not going to be any different, really, than any other car or any other, like, lawn implement you would have in your garage. Because treat this thing just like you would a two-stroke dirt bike or a two-stroke little chainsaw or something like that. Keep that principle in mind. That's how this car should be treated. So, first things first, right off the rip, maintain this chassis just like you would maintain any other normal car. The transmission, the diff, the suspension, none of that stuff is rotary specific. So if you know how to maintain a car, then you can maintain 95.9% .9 of an RX-8. The only thing that's different is that little tiny engine down there in the bottom, right? So this is a 1.3 liter Rotary engine, the spinning Doritos, it's got little triangles in it. They spin around really fast and there is no valves inside this engine. Hence the two-stroke dirt bike, two-stroke chainsaw reference. Now, before we jump into the premix elephant in the room, let's talk about the peripherals on this engine that you need to worry about, right? First things first, you can see that I have moved things out of the way. These cars tend to get hot on the racetrack. Don't be afraid of them getting hot on the street, but be afraid of them getting hot on the racetrack, okay? There's no good way for air to evacuate the engine bay, right? The engine radiator is laid flat, the air comes up, hits the air box, which would have lived right here, and the battery, which would have lived right here. Cooling is a very important thing, though, on these rotary engines. You probably have a low coolant light on, which is this little sensor right here, and this coolant overflow or your reservoir, they are prone to cracking. They are prone to breaking. They're also prone to when your car does overheat, if it does, this little vent will put fluid on your power steering. So in order to maintain your car, you need to keep a close eye on the condition of this little bottle. Make sure your car has coolant in it. If the sensor is not showing up on the dash, make sure it's not unplugged because if you unplug that, the light goes away and then no one will ever know. But it will also never come on when you're on coolant. And I would recommend doing something to reroute your uh, vent away from these main wires. So in addition to that cooling maintenance, you need to make sure that your factory under tray is on the car. Makes a huge difference to cooling these cars off. And that your factory ductwork for the oil coolers is in the front bumper as well. Or some sort of I made some out of some material from the local hardware store. If the air does not go through the radiator, the radiator cannot work. So keep your cooling system happy. Let's move to the next important thing about the rotary engine. Effective spark, okay? The older RX-8s have coils that are down here. And those coils on the older RX-8s aren't exactly the best or most reliable coil for running an engine at 9,000 RPM. Now, when you daily drive your car around, you're probably not gonna get a misfire or a check engine light that flashes because of the coils. Maybe you will, but if you keep it under 5,500 RPM, most ignition coils can handle the amount of power or just the demand that you're gonna be using at 5,500 RPM and under, which is also why if you watched the previous video, 
why I run 87 octane in my car. Okay, on daily driving, these things are horribly fuel efficient. They have get 17 mpg and that's about it. So if I'm not going to the track and I'm not hitting 9,000 rpm all the time, then I don't need to run the fancy coils and I don't need to run the fancy fuel because I'm not going to be fighting detonation when I'm just cruising it around town, right? Or just revving it out once to make sure I keep the carbon out of it. But those coils will give you a lot of fits. They are fairly cheap. I would recommend replacing them every, you know, 20 to 25,000 miles if you start having issues or upgrade them to a LS coil unit. Most of the time the plug wires are fine, but the plugs in these cars can also be very finicky. If you notice, my car can get a little bit hard to start nowadays. Well, I haven't changed the spark plugs and I run some premix and I would assume that there's probably a pretty good amount of carbon buildup in there, which would then lead to those plugs not working efficiently, which would then lead to the car not starting efficiently, right? So keep your plugs, keep your coils, keep everything happy because that is a very key part to making an RX-8 run really well is a happy ignition system right the rest of this intake albeit it looks super complex sitting in here is fairly simple to maintain and this is where you're going to pick up the most power and you're going to pick up good reliability from the things i'll show you here in a second in the shop and also because we have the relative where things are at here on my car before we go to the shop and talk in detail about these next two systems your oil metering pump resides right here this oil metering pump is what makes this two-stroke reminiscent, right? So that oil metering pump takes oil from the crankcase, your oil pan, and injects it into the rotor housings in order to lubricate the rotor housings. Much like a two-stroke, you can effectively pre-mix oil with your fuel and accomplish the exact same thing. And you know some scooters, snowmobiles, etc. would have a tank that you put the two-cycle oil in and it automatically injects it. The system on an RX-8 effectively uses your crankcase oil in order to accomplish that. So, it is very important with your RX-8. Honestly, probably the most important thing that you should take away from this video is that wherever you take your RX-8 to get the oil changes done, you need to use conventional oil. Do not use synthetic oil. If you use synthetic oil, then you need to either install a sewn adapter on your car, which bypasses the oil metering pumps using the crankcase oil, or you need to block off the oil metering pump and premix only in your car. The reason being, synthetic oil is not designed to burn cleanly, and these combustion chambers don't get that hot in order to burn off that synthetic oil, which is why you hear or saw at the very beginning of the video, a red line a day keeps the rotary doctor away. You want to get this combustion chamber hot because it doesn't effectively burn the fuel unless you do so. And unburnt fuel leads to a lot of carbon buildup, right? So the oil metering pumps here run conventional oil in your car. We're gonna go to the shop and I'm gonna give you guys a detailed look at how that system works and explain to you why running synthetic oil is bad, also the benefits of running premix, and why you really probably don't need to premix if you're just daily driving your car. And then we're also gonna look at the intake manifold all the valves therein and improving that system to keep your car happy for a long amount of time. Jumping right into the oil metering system on your RX-8, this is an oil metering pump that is off the car. Okay, this is an RX-8 oil metering pump. They're electronically regulated. The old school oil metering pumps, like this one on this 12A right here, have an actual lever that goes up to the carburetor so that as you depress the throttle pedal, it opens the oil metering pump and allows more oil into the combustion chamber. Now, this system has injectors, okay? Oil injectors. They reside right here in the housing. Now, there's two per rotor on an RX-8. On a Series 2 RX-8, which is a 2009 to 2011, there would be three oil injectors per rotor. And on the older engines, RX-7s, etc. Sometimes they were in the intake manifold, but on the RX-8s, they're not. Now, these little oil lines right here, you can see come up. They would connect on the top of the engine. Ah, right here, and you see there's an open port on the top of this. The top of that port is vacuum regulated. So the engine needs to create the vacuum in order to open 
these oil injectors up. Okay, so that's the different parts of your oil injection system. Now, on the front cover where the oil injection pump mounts right here, there's a port and that's what allows this to accept pressurized oil from the oil pan. So your RX-8 is going to burn oil throughout the course of its oil change lifespan, right? If you're going to drive 3,000 miles, it might burn a quart of oil. You can take this system and in the tune of the computer, you can plug a laptop in and you can turn the duty cycle of this pump up, thereby injecting more oil into the system. If you're doing that, you need to make sure that you are burning all of that oil that you're injecting into the combustion chamber. When you don't burn all that oil, the inside of your engine will start to look like this. You can see this RX-8 rotor that I have out of the engine has a ton of excessive carbon buildup, some rust. This came out of one with a blown coolant seal. But all of this little sandy dust is all carbon. You know, and this was in a manual transmission car. Typically, manual transmission RX-8s have less carbon buildup because the red line's higher. People like to rev out their manuals, keeps the carbon out of the engine. But if you have an automatic car or if you have one that was just babied around town and never got hot, you're going to see a lot of excessive carbon buildup inside your engine. Now, kind of coming back around to the premix and the sewn adapter thing. The sewn adapter is effectively a block off plate that goes between the oil metering pump and the engine. What that block off plate does is allows external oil to be fed into the oil metering pump. You then install a reservoir on the firewall somewhere and then you put regular two cycle oil or two cycle racing oil into that tank and it will inject, the oil metering pump system will inject the two stroke oil into your RX-8 engine instead of injecting oil pan crankcase oil. For that specific instance, you can run synthetic oil in the crankcase of your RX-8 because it's not injecting it into the combustion chamber. So unless you have that system in place, I would still recommend running a conventional oil. Now, running a conventional oil is not a detriment, you know, to the bearings inside your engine. You know, Renewable Rubicants makes a really good racing oil. Valvoline VR1 makes a really good racing oil. That's a conventional style 20W50, which is a very thick oil for these engines specifically. The oil temps get really hot. They tend to like that thicker oil. And that too, you know, the thick oil will contribute to it not getting burned at a lower temperature, right? So now you're going to ask, should I premix in addition to maintaining the oil metering pump system on my car? Now, I drive my RX-8 sometimes on the street, mostly on the track. My black RX-8 that I had before this one was solely a daily driver. My daily driver RX-8, I didn't premix at all in that car. I'm driving it to Nashville in traffic, sitting with the AC on, it's idling at 1,000 RPM. There's no reason to burden the inside of that engine with all that excess oil because all it's going to do is foul spark plugs and make my apex seals get stuck in here with all the excessive carbon buildup. Now, the green car, my current RX-8, like I said, I take it to the track and I beat on it. And it sees very hot combustion chamber, 230 degrees coolant temp, I think was the hottest I saw, maybe 260 degrees oil temps. I'm not that worried about there being unburnt fuel and unburnt carbon in the engine when I'm at the track. So when I go to the track, I leave the oil injection system, you know, hooked up, my racing oil, and I premix one half an ounce of premix per gallon of gas that I put in the engine. Now, I'm not that particular about what premix I run in my cars, okay? There are some that are better than others, there are some that aren't. If you're running a car like, for example, my rotary truck, has no oil injection pump on it and I'm premixing solely, then I just run the cheap premix because I need some sort of lubrication in there, but there's no sense in spending, you know, Itamitsu boutique brand premix money on a car that I literally fill it up with gas every week and that would get really expensive, right? So I run the cheap stuff, Walmart, Supertech, whatever. Now, the RX-8, where I know it's gonna sit for a while between fill-ups, this VP Racing, the Renewable Lubricants, your Idemitsu, most of those two-stroke oils are mixed with a base oil that will act like a fuel stabilizer 
within your fuel system. What does that benefit you? When my car is sitting out here in the cold all winter and I'm not driving it and that tank of really bad ethanol 93 gas is in there, the two-stroke oil that I run is going to keep that gas happy and volatile until I go drive it at the track the next time, right? So that's where the nicer two-stroke oil is really good. Now, if you can afford to run the nice two-stroke oil, then just run the nice two-stroke oil. It's not going to hurt anything. But it is effectively like when you run one of these nicer brands, it's like having sea foam injector cleaner, stuff like that, living in your fuel, stay bill, and that's what keeps that fuel system very, very happy. Now, the elephant in the room has been cleared up, but there's still one more baby elephant we need to talk about, and this is where a lot of people buying used RX-8s are going to find and have problems. The lower intake manifold and the upper intake manifold. So, this is a spare junkyard RX-8 engine with some intake manifolds I had laying around. To give you context, Here's your upper intake manifold. It sits on here like this, okay? There are valves in the intake manifold. I don't get that confused. We don't have a camshaft. We don't have a sort of things like that that are built into the engine. These are valves that control the airflow coming into your engine. And they optimize the torque curve and the power of the rotary engine. Not just the Holly primary and secondaries in a carburetor. This creates different flow patterns in order to optimize that torque. So those valves, when the engine and the combustion chambers are not getting hot, will get clogged up with unburnt fuel because you do get some overlap. You do get some exhaust and fuel and air pushed back into the intake manifold. And when these get clogged up and they quit working, your car will throw a check engine light and it's going to be a dog. It's going to be really slow. So these valves... They're all in the lower intake manifold, but they're controlled by solenoids on the back of the upper intake manifold. The solenoids look like this. This is one of them off of my green car. Got a sticker on it. BL for black. Now, there's a black, a gray, and a blue plug for each one of these solenoids. There is also going to be a dot on the vacuum line that comes out of these in order to match up the solenoid with the vacuum line to the receiving valve on the intake manifold. Make sure you got it right. You don't want one valve opening when the other one should have, and vice versa. These little solenoids click in, just like this, on the back of the intake manifold. They're very hard to reach if you're trying to take this off and leave the intake manifold on. It's not that hard to get this intake manifold off. So, simple way to test these solenoids. You can blow in it. Click this with a 9-volt battery or 12 volts if you have a power probe. You'll hear it click. Make sure the vacuum actuator works. That's part one. Part two to ensuring that these valves are functioning properly is actually inspecting the valve itself. So you can see the shutter valve in here. You can see it moving as I move the little actuator lever on it. That connects the front and rear rotor primary runner. It's operated by this it's operated by this small vacuum pot right here. So when the solenoid clicks on, it pulls vacuum on this, which then opens the valve at the time the ECU wants it to open. The next valve is probably the most important one. This is called your SSV. This valve lives in here, and you can see I haven't cleaned this one. And look at all the stuff, the carbon, the crappy unburned fuel that is built up on this valve over time, okay? See all that? It's supposed to be silver. It's supposed to be clean. That valve lives in here. You can see it's obviously a part, so it doesn't work perfectly. Similar vacuum pot to the butterfly valve. This one would have an electric sensor on it, a little micro switch, and that is the most common one to get stuck. You can get this valve out of the intake manifold with the engine in the car. Okay? You cannot remove the lower intake manifold from this engine while it's in the car. And if you can, I want to see how you do it because I haven't figured out a way to do it. Now, the next set of valves on this engine are called your auxiliary port valves. If you have an automatic RX-8, you probably don't have these, but I think 2007 and up automatic cars got a six port engine, so you will have these. The way you can tell from the outside is there would be a gear and a little electric motor that lives right here on this clean spot. This shaft goes through the lower intake manifold.
comes out right here on this gear. There is a rack and pinion style, uh, like flat. There's a rack and pinion style flat gear that lives inside this intake manifold. And that electric motor spins the gear, which spins the rack, opens and closes these sleeves. Okay, you can see this sleeve has a slot in it. When the slot is facing away from the combustion chamber, it's closed. When the slot is facing towards the combustion chamber, it's opened. Now, these fifth and sixth auxiliary ports, when this gets all gummed up in here and they don't work, your car is going to feel like a real slow car because it's not going to have any top end. It's going to hit a nice wall at about 5,500. It'll still rev out, but you'll definitely get misfires. You'll definitely have weird stuff happening, and you want this system to work because that gives you that 200 horsepower that RX-8s have. And if you don't have that, you're definitely making like 130. So these sleeves slide into the front and rear iron up here. And you can see on this end, which is out of Calvin's RX-8, this six-port sleeve is physically stuck in the front iron. It's closed. We can't get it out. That front iron is probably junk because of that. You don't want to be that guy because you definitely don't have horsepower even if your engine runs. So those items... Your lower intake manifold, if those valves are not functioning properly, you need to get in there, do some maintenance, and make sure that those are working. Otherwise, you're just going to fight your car all the time, and you're not going to like it. And it's going to be really slow. With that, there's not much else that you need to do to your rotary engine in order to maintain it, just like you would maintain a Corvette 350Z, any other piston internal combustion engine car. Change the oil regularly. Don't go too long between your oil changes. Run a good oil filter in an RX-8. Don't run synthetic oil unless you've addressed the things I mentioned before. And if you're going to the track, you know you're going to rage on it, do some pre-mixing. If you know you're just going to daily drive your car, you're not beating on it that hard, then don't pre-mix. I can tell you from experience, I've seen beautiful engines with lots of miles on them that have never seen a drop of pre-mix in their entire life. And have just been maintained really well. And when they come apart, they look awesome on the inside. Ready for a rebuild. Fresh apex seals. Housings look mint. I've also seen engines that have been pre-mixed only. That the inside of the engine is completely ruined. And I've done that myself to engines. Run a hard apex seal. Don't get enough pre-mix. It chews everything up. So there's definitely a balance there. But here's what I'll tell you. And the reason I say you don't need to pre-mix. 100%. If you're just daily driving your car on the street, run good oil, rev it out, get that carbon out of the engine. You're not going to have an excessive amount of wear on your engine. And understand that even if you premix, even if you do all of these things perfect, I would not expect your RX-8 engine to go further than 100,000 miles without needing a rebuild. Now, that doesn't mean your car is not reliable. That just means that its lifespan is shorter. Just like BMWs, they replace their rod bearings all the time because... Doesn't make the BMW break down. It just means that that's a wear item that they want to see you replace. And unfortunately, on a Mazda RX-8, the engine is just not a small block Chevy, and it won't do 400,000 miles before it needs the first set of rings. Like, it's just, that's just a fact of these things. So, do the things I mentioned. Drive your RX-8 like you stole it. Get that combustion chamber hot. And premix if you think you need it. But if not, drive your cars. They're still one of the best cars out there. Don't be afraid to put miles on them. And definitely find a good rotary mechanic around you if you need help with the rotary engine specific things. But a majority of the stuff that's going to go wrong on an RX-8 is not caused by the rotary engine. But when those things do go wrong, you will probably see failures within the rotary engine if you don't address them in a timely manner. So with that, guys, go hit 9,000 RPM in your RX-8. I'm going to go get warm. It's cold down here in Tennessee now. I want to thank you guys very much for watching. Definitely go check out the other videos on the channel if you want to learn how to rebuild one of these engines yourself. If you want to learn how clearancing side seals and fitting corner seals and all of that stuff works. I've got a lot of good how-to videos. And if I don't address exactly what you need to know on that video, drop it in the comments below. And I can try to get your question answered. We'll see you guys in the next one. Keep it rad and stay warm. So I haven't been doing the vlog videos every week, but don't worry, I'm still filming stuff. We're still working on this car, still developing some other things, filming some other content. All of that stuff is going to be dropping here soon, but don't worry. We're still building cars. We're still going to go race some stuff. We're still going to go to the track. The RX-8, my green one, will still get abused in the front yard, and you guys will get to see it. 
eventually. Fortunately, this lovely day, finally got to experience some daylight and it is wonderful. So let's find the dog. Hey, buddy, come here. You cold? Hey, is it cold outside? Yeah. You jump to stay warm? Hey. Yeah. What you been digging at? Your nose is all dirty. Huh? What are you shivering? <laughs> what are you doing? Well, you guys are lucky. You caught her and she's cold and running around and going crazy. Hey, come here. Come here. Oh, here she goes. Laddie, come here. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come here. You guys are getting the extra long daylight tour of the Rad Ranch in the winter because we're going to go see what the dogs are digging up up here. So this is my mountain bike jump course that I haven't ridden in a long time because they opened a new mountain bike jump riding place, park, just up the street. So I haven't really maintained my jumps all year because I've just been riding somebody else. A big wooden ramp. What are you doing? Did you dig a hole? Dogs are funny. Thank you guys for watching. Definitely subscribe if you want to learn more about these cars. Go check out the other videos on the channel. I promise that uh, we got some really good content from coming for you guys. And uh, just kind of shifting from doing regular vlogs to doing well put together. You know, every build is going to be a well put together video now instead of just what I do on a Tuesday night. So with that, thank you guys very much for watching. If you want to support the channel in addition to subscribing and watching the videos go check out the patreon we may start doing vlogs over there if we get enough interest but uh just trying to put good stuff out there for you guys peace keep it red